Welcome everyone uh, to the AI session for the CSE Research Open House. Uh, I'm Taylor Burkirkpatrick. Patrick. Uh, I'm going to be chairing this session. I'm not going to be doing much. Mostly it'll be the students. Uh, we have uh, three very cool presentations today from some of our own PhD students. Uh, first up will be Cyrus Rashian, and he's going to talk today about explainable k-means clustering. Then uh, Dongjia Wu is going to talk about uh, very exciting, uh, COVID-19 analytics using AI machine learning. Uh, and then finally, Nilafar uh, Muresh Gala is gonna talk about uh, privacy and computer vision. Um, so we've got some exciting talks. These are each gonna be back-to-back 10-minute -back talks. So it's, we're gonna be, you know, time will be a little compressed. Um, what we'll do is after each talk, uh, we can take some questions over, over the chat channel um, and I can read out the questions and we'll have the speakers respond. Well, but I'll try to keep an eye on time because we don't want to run out of time for the whole session. We're supposed to end at 3.30. Um, all right, with that, take it away, Cyrus. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, excited to talk. So I'm Cyrus Rashjan. Um, I'm actually a postdoc at UCSD, uh, but you know, you can think of me as, stu as a student, that's cool. I'll feel young again. Uh, and today I want to talk about um, some of our work on explainable k-means clustering. And this is joint work with Sanjay Dasgupta, Neve Frost, and Michal Mashkovitz. Uh, so let me start by talking about explainable machine learning more generally. And algorithms are increasingly used for human-centered applications like healthcare, resume screening, and credit loans. And the trust of these algorithms hinges on their transparency. For example, imagine you receive an email that says, hey, you've been selected to get the vaccine. And you tell your friend and they ask, uh, you know, why you, why not me? Puzzled, you say, um, I'm not sure. You know, the email didn't say. The email would have been more informative if it said you've been selected because you were at least 30 years old and you're an educator. Then you would be happy because you would get to receive the vaccine, um, but you can also provide an explanation to your friends. And so these types of explanations can be added to a whole variety of algorithms. And one way to do so is to use a decision tree. And a decision tree is just a simple binary tree where each node has a binary yes or no question. You know, are you at least 60 or not? Uh, is your job an educator or not? And this defines a path from the root of the tree to the leaf. And so these are, this is a way to define explainability and use explainability for algorithms because we can say that the outcomes of the algorithms are the leaves of the decision tree. Uh, and so then every possible outcome is sort of corresponding to a set of decisions that led there. The issue though, in using explainable methods often is that there may be a drop in accuracy. So some very complicated methods like deep learning, random forests uh, are very accurate on a variety of tasks, uh, but they're hard for humans to interpret. And yet the other extreme, very explainable methods um, may suffer. And so one thing that we asked is when is it possible to provide explanations without trading off too much accuracy or cost? And concretely, we explored this in, in the context of k-means. As a quick recap, k-means is a problem of taking a data set of real vectors and partitioning them into k clusters, where the cost of a clustering is just the sum of the squared distances from the centers of the clusters to the points in those clusters. And so here's an example of a five means clustering on some synthetic data sets. This is a well-studied problem. Um, it's NP-hard to find the lowest cost clustering. There's tons of approximation algorithms. It's a very old question. Uh, the challenge though, is that these clusters themselves are just, uh, you know, the points that are closest to the center in some high dimensional space might be very complicated. And so it's not clear what part of the space, what points end up in what cluster and why. So our motivation was to understand how to interpret the cluster assignments. In particular, we wanna minimize the k-means costs or other objectives while also being able to explain why a point ended up in its cluster. So what we do is we use a decision tree to do this. And so here's an example where on the left is a near optimal five means clustering. The middle is a tree-based clustering where the salient difference is you can kind of see that all the splits are access aligned and this partitions the space into these rectangles and the tree that generates this clustering is on the right. Uh, if you solve this problem, one natural way to do it is to say like, let's just cluster the data set with an arbitrary clustering algorithm, you know, our favorite k-means clustering algorithm, and then use a standard decision tree method 
to learn the sort of clusters and therefore be able to explain them. And the issue here is that there are very simple data sets that show this might lead to a really bad approximation. So here's an example where there's three clusters and two points are kind of at the top by themselves. And many algorithms are going to evenly split the data, which means they're going to first split the data in half uh, to create some sort of balance. And the problem here is the actual k-means cost is really small because the clusters are really tightly knit. And so the squared distances is, are pretty small. But if these orange points, you know, once you split in the middle, once one of the orange points is going to be assigned to either the blue or the green cluster. And if the orange points are really far away, this is going to lead to a super high cost. And so that's bad. So in short, many standard decision tree algorithms are not going to work for clustering. Um, so we design a new algorithm. It's still going to be a top-down decision tree building algorithm, but we do it a little bit differently and we get provable guarantees. Um, our algorithm is called the iterative mistake minimization algorithm. It's actually very simple. We start by clustering the data set with some standard clustering algorithm. This gives us k clusters with k centers. And then we're going to just start by building the tree one node at a time. And all we're going to do is minimize the number of mistakes, where the number of mistakes is the number of points that are separated from the reference center by a split. So let me explain this by example. Here are like five clusters in sort of a standard k-means solution. The first thing we're going to do is split at x less than 5.5, because this makes only one mistake, that little red x. And then we're going to do this again, and do this again, and do this again. And every time, we're just searching for the split that makes as few mistakes as possible. Uh, this leads to a tree of size k, small as possible, because there's k leaves, one cluster per leaf. And we get to prove that um, the tree-based clustering cost of this method is at most k squared times the optimal cost for k means. And it's at most O of k for k medians. And the reason this is really cool to me is because uh, there's no dependence on the data set size, the dimensionality, kind of how spread out the data is. It really only depends on the number of clusters. Uh, and mathematically, theoretically, we're able to uh, bound the cost with a, a pretty new proof idea where we look at the k-means cost in terms of the number of mistakes. And we show that essentially, if the number of mistakes is large, then the actual optimal cost, the best possible clustering cost, must also be large. Um, so that's kind of the, the main algorithm I wanted to explain. We also have a follow-up work where we have an algorithm that is faster in practice and also allows us to expand the tree to more leaves. And the idea here is that we're going to start with the IMM algorithm, the one from the previous slide, and then we're going to expand it to use more leaves while still having k clusters. And our little trick to do this faster is what we're going to do is we use what's called the surrogate cost. Um, and the idea here is that we're just going to fix the centers at every step instead of recomputing them. This makes it faster. There's a simple dynamic program to expand the tree. And what you get um, on some data set, for example, this is a subset of the 20 news groups data sets. We start off with a, a tree with four leaves. This leads to four clusters. But say we want to expand it to have a more expressivity, a larger tree that you know, refines the clusters. And so we can do that with this method. And a, a really nice thing, I think, about this expansion algorithm that we call XKMC um, is that we get a very good approximation on a bunch of data sets. And so here are like six you know, sort of standard small data sets. Um, we've tested it on a whole bunch of data sets. And the green and the black lines are our method where we expand the tree, either starting with the IMM tree or starting with an empty tree. They're pretty similar. Um, and basically, we see that compared to some baselines like KD tree or CART, you know, a standard decision tree method, we're getting a much lower cost in general. Um, and we have this code online. I'll, set, I'll show a link in a second. Um, anyone can use it. I think it's kind of a pretty simple, fast solution for k-means that always produces a tree that's pretty small. Uh, and so, you know, therefore, it's a lot easier to interpret what's going on with the clustering. Um, popping back up, um, I think this area of trustworthy machine learning is super important. It's something that I work on a lot and I think about. And I think that, you know, in addition to clustering, there's graph problems, classification, applications, where, you know, all of these areas, in my opinion, have a bunch of key technical challenges that lead to a rich theory about how to design better algorithms that say are explainable or fair or robust or private. Um, and, and they're also very useful in practice because now that machine learning is being used, in, used for like human-centered applications, you know, we want more from our algorithms. 
Um, so I'll end with two links. Um, the thing on the left is a blog that I help edit and moderate. Um, and so we have some short blog posts on our algorithms and the proofs. Um, and on the right is just a, sort of a link to the GitHub for our code. Uh, so thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Cyrus. Very cool work. Um, and I'm so sorry for calling you a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, so we already have one question in the chat, but feel free to, to ask further questions now. Sure. Um, so Tan may ask, are the cutaways orthogonal to each other? That's probably in reference to a particular slide. So maybe. Uh, the cuts are not necessarily orthogonal to each other. So it makes uh, it's sense in a lot of cases. For example, if you have one dimensional data, then you're always going to cut along the same line. So they'd be like parallel to each other. Um, cool. Uh, another question, do you think this could be applied in order to make very black box processes such as social media recommender systems a little more transparent to the public? And yeah. that's from, from Joseph. Cool. Thanks, Joseph. That's an awesome question. Um, I'm a big proponent of decision trees. I think they should be used for everything. They're surprisingly useful. Um, I think it might take a little bit of work to um, think about how to reframe the recommendation system in a way that we can uh, explain it a little bit easier because you know if we're having like these huge high dimensional data sets and these very complicated recommendations it takes a little bit of work to get the right objective um, but yeah recommendations are great let's make them explainable cool oh it seems more of an explanation i'm trying to relate this isolation for us versus extended isolation for us when i asked about the cuts uh, you, that seems like a somewhat technical question. I'm happy to answer it later. Isolation forests are sort of these, you know, if you want to detect outliers, right? And um, I don't know what extended isolation forests are, and I don't know if they impose uh, orthogonalists. But if you want to follow up with me, I'm happy to talk more about this. Yeah, it seems like a, a, a better offline question. Starting to get sure. into the well, for sure. Um, any uh, any more questions, or should we jump to the next talk? All right. Well, let's thank uh, let's thank Cyrus again. A little Zoom applause, um, and uh, thank you, Cyrus. And uh, uh, Dongzi, are you ready to ready to jump in and present? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, this is Dong Xiaowu. I'm a first year PhD student, and today I will give a brief talk about my recent research for COVID nineteen forecasting. Uh, considering the ongoing pandemic all over the world, it is crucial for us to have a model that can make trustworthy predictions for our government, companies, universities, and everyone here to assess the risk and make corresponding decisions. And we are very proud that our proposal method has been included to CDC Forecasting Ensemble. And our team is called UCSD-NEU. And we are continuing to make contributions by submitting national and state level forecasting results every week. Here, I would like to thank to my advisor, Rosu Yama, and also my collaborator, Li Yao from UW, and Xinyue Mateo Alexandro from Northeastern University. Okay, the goal of our project is to learn a model that can make predictions in the future based on the history. To capture this temporal dependency, we use the recurrent neural network autoencoder structure. This figure shows an example for death predictions at country level. We first use a window to obtain historical observations as input. Then the model will generate corresponding sequences as output for predictions. And we are interested in making predictions at both country and state level. To realize this, a straightforward way is to just train another 50 models for all states. But in this way, we assume every states are independent with each other. That's a very strong assumption, because in reality, people still travel during the pandemic. That's why we also need to consider spatial dependencies, and we capture it using diffusion process on a directed graph. As is shown on the right figure, there will be 50 nodes on, uh, in the graph for 50 states, and they save the corresponding features for each state. The edge in the graph rep represents the fraction of the population from a source state to a target state for air travel. In order to capture both temporal and spatial dependencies, we add the diffusion convolutional layer to RN structure to mimic the diffusion process. And the model is called DCRN. But why the diffusion process can be represented by a graph convolution? Actually, for that part, there's a lemma provided 
the stationary distribution of diffusion process can be represented as a weighted combination of infinite random works. And the random works is the same as a fixed step diffusion. Here is an example of diffusion filter. It can be approximate um, by weighted combination from zero step diffusion to k-step diffusion. Okay, so at this point, we already have a diff uh, deep learning model DCRN, which can capture spatial temporal dependencies. But is it enough to predict accurate predictions? The answer is no, because of the limited data available, especially at the early stage of the pandemic. The total number of observations could be even smaller than 10 at the early stage which makes the forecasting task challenging since we know that deep learning model usually suffers from small data issue. That's why we need a first principle of physics based model as guidance. And we use GLEAM, the global epidemic and mobility model provided by Nocitan group. This tool combines real world data on populations and human mobility with comprehensive stochastic models of disease transmission. Therefore, it is capable to deliver both analytic and forecasting power. I will not explain the full details because of the time limit, but you are welcome to go through it using the provided links below. The next step is to combine physics-based model with deep learning. We use DCRN to forecast the difference between GLEAM predictions and observations and develop a new model called Deep GLEAM. This figure shows the model details. We first compute the residual between the GLEAM predictions and observation data as a historical feature. Then we combine this historical feature with travel graph to generate sequence input. We then pass this input into the hidden deep neural network to obtain a sequence of embedding. We use an encoder to propagate the embeddings over time. And the final hidden state of the encoder is used as a starting point as a decoder. And when we try to forecast, we use the decoder, which also is also a diffusion convolutional RN, to generate the future forecast over the next four weeks. In this way, we will get point estimate as predictions, which is good, but still not enough. Uh, since in high stake domains like COVID-19 forecast, it is critical to generate probabilistic forecast with confidence intervals for risk assessment and decision making. Therefore, we experiment different uncertainty quantification methods for both frequencies and Bayesian point of view. One of the frequencies methods is called quantile regression. The basic idea is to set several confidence interval tau and use a row function uh, as the loss to train the model so that the model will make predictions for the corresponding confidence level. One of the Bayesian methods is called stochastic gradient Markov chain Monte Carlo, SGMCMC. The idea is to add the noise to stochastic gradient descent. In this way, it can sample the posterior distribution efficiently. Also, there is a theoretical guarantee that the chain will finally converge to the posterior distribution of the model. The right figure shows an example of a chain. And we then run multiple chains to generate samples to quantify the predictions uncertainty. And at this point, we get our final version of deep gleam model. Um, to, eva to evaluate the performance of deep gleam, we use mean absolute error for accurate accuracy measurement and the mean interval score for uncertainty quantification. Um, so it is an interval scoring function. We choose this metric is because it does not require full predictive distribution and therefore it is easy to compute. And for both metrics, a lower score represents better performance. Then we use mean absolute error to compare the deep gleam model in red with two baselines from one to three weeks ahead. The deep model is pure data driven in green and the gleam model is pure physics based model in orange. When we compare deep model with gleam and deep gleam, we find that the performance difference is very big because of the largest data issue I mentioned before. Furthermore, our deep gleam model successfully learned and corrected the bias of gleam to achieve the best performance. The figure on the right shows more details of forecast result. It visualizes weekly death predictions among these three methods in California from week 23 to week 37. The weeks are in the year 2020 from May 31st to September 12th. 
the prediction of the dash line are in the test set while others are in the training and validation set. It can be observed that the deep model in blue fails to predict the complex dynamics of COVID-19 evolution, but just predict a general trend. While the deep gleam model in orange successfully corrected the shift of gleam in green and matched the truth best. Finally, this slide shows some uncertainty quantification result for when we can had death predictions still from week 20, 23 to week 37. There are six subplots. The upper left one is at the country level. We also selected five states with large populations, which are California, Florida, Georgia, New York, and Massachusetts. We compare frequentist method quantile in green with Bayesian method SGMCMC in orange, and find that both methods matches the dynamics well and covers the truth in most of the cases. The difference is that Bayesian methods are typically more accurate and robust in mean predictions, while confidence levels obtained from frequentist methods provide more extensive co coverage over the data variations. Okay, to conclude, we applied DCRN for spatial temporal forecasting and then developed deep gleam model, which combines physics based model with deep, deep learning. Sorry. And finally, we started uncertainty quantification and generate confidence intervals for rich assessment and decision making. Yeah, um, that's it. And we have two minutes to answer the questions, but feel free to send me email if you have further questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dong Xia. Um, uh, yeah, we have, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Does anybody have questions about this work? Here's a question uh, from you, Tong. Uh, there seems to be some artifacts in prediction, sharp increasing, decreasing. Uh, any ideas on that? Sharp increase and decrease. I like this part. Yeah, so before the dash line, there are part of the data for training and part of data for validation. That could be the reason. But uh, if you take a look at the lines after this dash line is actually for the test, and actually for the test result, um, the confidence interval in most of the case covers the uh, truth. I have, I have a quick question. Oh, um, sure. And sorry if I missed this in the talk, but approximately how much data are you, are you training this on? Like, I guess, I guess this is related to kind of how many different locations you're tracking in the data, how big of a time span you're using in train and how often there are samples for either death rates or, or infection rates. Right, right, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking. And for the spatial part, we just include the 50 states in the US. Uh, for the time span, uh, we actually do early stage detection, which is very challenging. So basically for the training data and validation, we only use about 12 to 15 weeks of data. And, and with one sample per week? Uh, yes, we do weekly prediction. That's why the data is- Gotcha, super gotcha, data. okay. Cool, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, we can, uh, we can leave a little time at the end in case you have questions based on any of the earlier talks. Uh, so let's, let's, let's thank Dongjia real fast. A little clapping is good. All right, uh, thank you, Dongjia. And now, uh, Nilifar, are you ready to take over? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. And um, I'm, uh, I'm Fatima or Nilifar, both names are good. I'm a third year PhD student. I'm Taylor's a student actually, and I'm going to be talking about a recent um, dub, dub, dub paper, um, which the name is not all features are equal, discovering essential features for preserving prediction privacy. So now what does this actually mean? Um, to provide some context, um, just I wanna focus um, for a couple of minutes on the importance of privacy, especially like as we have more devices, we have more surveillance, we have more devices in our homes that are constantly listening and we are really trusting, we're putting a lot of trust into the people who are collecting this data and maybe some of that trust is misplaced. Like how can we take more control on what they do with our data and how can we be able to like govern it better? So it's really important to think about privacy and to realize that we're being watched really closely and it's kind of scary when you think about it. 
So um, with that, I want to um, dive deeper into the actual problem setup that we are focusing on. So the problem that we are looking at is, um, let's assume that you have like, you have taken a picture, um, it could be like on your phone, uh, or it could be like a device that you have in your home that, it, that has this capability. So it's like an edge device. We're not talking about like, you know, um, kind of, um, huge devices via resource constraint. And you want to send this, uh, this image to a deployed machine learning and specifically like a deep learning model on a service provider. And you want to have something run on it. Maybe you want to like simple task, a smile detection. Maybe you want to apply a filter. You know, you want to like make yourself look old, all those things that were kind of really trendy a while back. So you want to do those things and you send your picture to this, uh, to this cloud that you don't really trust. You send it and you ask the query like, you know, is this person smiling? And then you get a response back. Now, what is the problem here? The problem is that A, you're sending your raw image. So that is one problem. So if anyone intercepts this connection or even like at the like at the level of the cloud, anyone could like misuse this image. They could try to like extract more information from it. They could like get your location from the background. They could, they could understand a lot of things just from this one image. So um, the problem is that once your data leaves your device, you don't have any more control on what happens with it. Anything goes. So um, what we are suggesting is that it's this mechanism called cloak and uh, like one sample, like for this image, this is what you see. So what cloak does and the intuition it builds on is that you, are, you, you have this deployed model, it's supposed to do one task. So let's uh, change our representation of the data so that this one task could work correctly, but other tasks uh, would not you know, render good questions, like accurate questions. So here for the smile detection, if you pay attention, like this, the smile section is like not uh, obfuscated, but the rest of the image is uh, suppressed. And yeah, so um, like when you when you give this to a model, if it's supposed to do smile detection, it's going to succeed. But if it tries to guess if this person has eyeglasses or you know their hair color, it's not going to work. Uh, now, uh, this one important thing is that we should remember the prior works and like what what the state is uh, with this problem. Um, it's not that this problem is like we no one has thought of it and like you know no one has worked on it. There has been a lot of work on it, but most of the work focuses on uh, using cryptographic security measures so that you're sure that you know like you have a secure connection. Your data, if someone like gets access to it, they cannot break it. It's like encrypted, and also uh, in many cases the model on the server side is also. In encrypted so like no data leaks while it's going through this pipeline and you get your response. So cryptography is like really good. You have this really strong guarantee. Everything is good. But the problem is a it has a lot of computation and communication overhead. So uh, like especially for uh, resource constrained devices, you can't really you know send all that huge payload and it's going to take a long time. So you don't want to like wait an hour to get like an image back. You want to like send it and like get it back in like a couple seconds. So this is one problem. And another problem is that you need cooperation from whoever is giving you the service to deploy this for you. So you need them to encrypt their model. You need them to give you this channel. And in most cases, in many cases, they're not going to do that. So um, this is like one problem. Uh, so you know, if, if these problems don't exist, definitely people should use cryptographic methods. It has a good guarantee, you know, like there's no question there. But the solution that we're offering is like for resource constraints set up, you don't want to have a lot of overhead. And also you want to be able to have control yourself. Like, you know what you're sending. You can, you can do this uh, your, on your own device to your own images and you don't need them to do anything for you. So we also show that even if there is black box access, you can still you know, do this and kind of obfuscate your images like this. But there are no uh, cryptographic guarantees. We show some mutual information guarantees so that like information wise, you're just decreasing it, but there is no worst case guarantee here. Okay, so uh, with this, I'm going to like give you an intuition on how this method works. Um, so technically what you do is normally you send your image and you know, you get the response. Now, if you take out part of the image, you like, you know, add noise to it or remove it somehow and you send it, if, um, if the query response comes back with a low accuracy, then that feature was important. But if it comes back with a high accuracy, so like if you take the forehead out, uh, then that, pe that feature is irrelevant. It's like less important. So building on this, um, we wanted to kind of have a more principled manner of doing this. You don't want to just you know, keep like moving this box around an image. So how we actually do this in a more principled manner is that we take the input image, we call each pixel a feature. 
And then what we do is we train two tensors. So you have only two sets of trainable parameters. You're not touching the deployed model. You just have these two uh, parameters. One of them is the standard deviation of the noise and the other one is the mean of the noise. And you're trying to train these so that uh, A, you have good accuracy and B, your noise increases. So while this, when this training finishes, if a pixel has a high standard deviation for its designated noise, then it's less important. And if it has a lower standard deviation, it's more important. So this is the intuition. And you know, you'd sample from this noise, you apply this to the image and you know, you send it and then you get the response back. But it's not like in, in reality, what we did is not this simple. Like for suppressing, we don't rely on noise. We actually rely on some constant values that we have trained and we've seen that they do better than noise. So you end up with something that kind of looks like this. And there are some, uh, you know, there's some like nuances to it. So if you're interested, you can ask me or like read the paper, but you can't just like train the noise like this, you know, because if you train a standard deviation tensor, it could get negative. So you have to do some reparameterizations to A, be able to calculate gradients on the noise and B, be able to have a constrained um, kind of noise that is not negative. And the standard deviation is not negative. So um, the loss function that we use, it's, uh, it looks complicated, but it's fairly trivial. There is a cross entropy loss term that it kind of makes sure that you have good accuracy. And then there is this other term we call it the privacy term. It tries to increase the amount of the standard deviation of the noise so that you, know, you, you obfuscate, you uh, kind of remove and suppress more features. And then we have a lambda, which is kind of a trade-off. You know, like you want better accuracy, let's obfuscate less. You want you know, more accuracy, let's, let's do more. Um, okay, so I'm going to first show some qualitative results uh, for like more, uh, we have attack scenarios, we have black box, white box comparisons, there are a lot of things that we tried. So if you're interested in those, um, you know, feel free to look at the paper, but right now I just want to focus more on qualitative results uh, first. So um, here on the first row, what you see is the features, like the important remaining features uh, for different tasks. So if you're looking at hair, glasses, or smile, what the model was looking at kind of makes sense. For like hair, it was looking at the top of the person's head. For glasses, it's the eyes. And for smile, it's like your lips. So it kind of makes sense. Now you can push the model further, like to get like um, lose a bit more accuracy, but get fewer features. So if you like push it further, that's what it's going to look like. And then when we actually suppress these values with these constant, um, constant uh, numbers that we have, you end up with something that looks like this. You can see the hair, you can see the eyes, but you can't really get anything more out of it. And um, another thing that uh, we have tried in, uh, in kind of a follow-up work was that we wanted to see how this works in a real world scenario with like medical images, which is it's like more sensitive. So what we did was, was we took some pancreas segment, uh, we took some uh, CT scans of pancreas and we wanted to see like how the segmentation is working. And you know, like if you want to find the pancreas, what is it that the model is looking at? But so the thing with pancreas is that it's not like a smile, it actually moves. It could be anywhere in the body because of the how you section the data. So we can see that here, like um, through the animations, like the more we add noise, like you get fewer remaining. Uh, few remaining organs. And what we found out was that pancreas segmentation models usually rely on the kidneys to find the pancreas. So that was also like something that, you know, this could also help with explanations. Um, so for uh, qualitative, for quantitative results, the ones that I'm showing here, it's the privacy accuracy trade-off. So like, you know, how much mutual information are you losing? Like, um, it's kind of like how much data you're removing and how much accuracy loss you get. And we see that you can like remove 85% of the image with losing only 1% accuracy. So there's a lot of redundant information in all the images that we're sending. And another thing that we looked at was that it was post hoc fairness for classifiers. So if you apply this and then you feed this image to a classifier that is already trained, we learned that it, it makes more fair decisions. And that is because you know, you're removing a lot of features. So it cannot really like, if it was basing its decision on gender, it right now doesn't have those tools. So it ends up kind of like relying more on other features. So this is another use case of some, you know, something like this. And um, yeah, so actually I'm done. Um, just to conclude is that, you know, we have, you're like sending our information to a lot of different people for a lot of different purposes. And it's nice, it would be good if we think about how we can take more control. And this is like one small step in, you know, trying to have a grip on your own data and, you know, making the decision yourself. And with that, you know, feel free to email me if you have any questions. We also have code, um, it's on GitHub. You can also, if, if you need it. And yeah, I'm, I think if you, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thanks, Nilafar. Uh, <laughs> no, applause. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, like uh, any any questions, feel free to send them on chat. We, we already have a first question. This is from Tanme. Uh, so is a learned encoder at the client side and the classifier on the server? So uh, for like for the vanilla kind of type for like how we did it in the paper is that the entire classifier, the entire model is on the server and you can't touch it. What we do is we only have these two tensors, the standard deviation and the mu. But if, as, but this way you end up with the static kind of maps. Uh, if you want it to be more dynamic, you would need to have a small encoder. So for like for the pancreas case, we, we put a very small encoder on the uh, on the client side so that you can kind of find where the location of the pancreas is and then you know apply the noise like that. So there is a small encoder on the device. Yeah. But but you're sending the image again, so you're not sending any representations. You're sending the actual image. So you know it's yeah. Cool. I think I had I had kind of a similar question, but it was more like, um, have you have you tried this where uh, you're actually noising the the kind of like convolutional feature representations? And it sounds like you have maybe for the pancreas setup. Is that right? Um, so you mean like add noise in the middle layers? Yeah. Of course, that means that the encoder has to be client side, which isn't really your use case. But I'm I'm just sort of. I'm curious, does that lead to kind of better privacy or, or worse? Um, or? So there is actually, so this has been done. We, we are actually hmm. like in a previous paper, we are also did it. So it's like in a setup called, I, I told you once a split learning, there okay. you split it. So then you have access to the first few layers and you can add your noise on device. But hmm. if you don't have access, you know, to, to like to the model, then it's kind of hard to do it. But in split learning, there are lots of papers who do this like differently. Um, you know, yeah, so people have done it. And it's in fact better because like the more layers you do, like the more processing you have done. So normally right. you end up with a more abstract representation, less information, but yeah. Makes sense. Cool. Oh, another question from Tanmay. Uh, he says, non-technical question. Is this implemented in one of Open Mind's libraries? Yes, I think Open Mind is implementing this. Um, I'm actually like working with their engineers. Um, yeah, you can like, feel free to email me. I'll show you where it is. But the split learning is implemented and not this one, but a prior version is. So email me and I'll yeah, send you the code. Cool. Uh, we're right at 3.30, but here's one last question. So uh, let's, let's, we can do this one. Um, could the accuracy potentially increase since we focus on the specific feature of importance and open few ties with explainable AI? So that is a really good question. Uh, we didn't try like getting these representations and then training a new classifier on them. So maybe if you do that, you end up with a better model in general that that could happen. We haven't tried this though. It's a, it's a really good question actually. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, I guess we should close because we're right at the boundary. But uh, if you have any further questions for any of the speakers, please feel free to reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be excited to talk to you. Uh, and let's thank everyone one more time uh, for, for presenting their, their awesome work. Um, thank you all. Um, with that, uh, thank you audience for attending and we'll close the session so you can go to the, the next sessions. All right, goodbye all. Oh.